Haiti is quite literally falling apart. Honestly, my friends, when we are talking about things in history, there are very few countries that have struggled with development like Haiti. Since breaking free from French colonial rule over two centuries ago, the Caribbean state has weathered multiple foreign interventions, chronic political instability, constant social unrest, and devastating natural disasters that have destroyed the country when it wasn't already being destroyed by its own systems. And there is nothing that perhaps exemplifies this greater than the fact that gangs have effectively taken over the entire country. A recent spike of violence in Haiti's capital, Port-au-Prince, is preventing the World Food Program, the WFP, from actually reaching hundreds of thousands of people who currently are in urgent need of basic food and supplies. Conflict between varying groups of armed gangs is only worsening as time goes on, which in turn turns the capital city into a battleground, one in which the common people are stuck with really no way out or salvation to come. Very quickly, this is taking a bad situation and turning the entire thing into an escalating humanitarian crisis. Per the United Nations Food Agency, the latest violence which broke out early this February has forced nearly 10,000 people to flee their homes in merely just 10 days. The chaos that this has brought has in turn prevented the agency from reaching over 370,000 people who are in urgent need of food. Now very obviously, the situation in Haiti was already not good, but the recent upsurge in violence between different gangs has blocked cargo routes, which in turn has restricted movement and closed schools, which has forced the WFP to temporarily halt many activities activities across the country, meaning the only people who are able to actually help them in the scenario are not actually able to help. Considering the subject that we we're talking about here, there is definitely a limitation as to what I can actually show, considering that this is going to be going onto YouTube. But the WFP has said that school closures has stopped the group from being able to provide meals for around 300,000 children, because the violence in certain neighborhoods was just stopping it from being able to do anything to actually reach the families there. In addition to that, plans to distribute the food to displace people through communal kitchens outside of school elsewhere in the capital has also been complicated due to the severe safety issues that all of this entails. In recent weeks, the agency has said that it's been unable to reach 56,000 people that live in the city Sulil neighborhood, including people that are on the brink of slipping into the worst category of food insecurity, something that is famine-like in terms of its conditions. If the gang violence continues, if aid continues to be intercepted, if things don't actually get better, this could push things back into what is officially known as the catastrophe levels of food insecurity. The United Nations currently estimates that some 44% of Haitians are now facing acute food insecurity, and that as of January of this year in 2024, children accounted for over half of some 314,000 people that were forced to flee their homes due to the conflict. And unfortunately, it's not like this situation is really going to get any better, it seems. It was only this last year, in 2023, that the United Nations would ratify sending an international force to go and help the police within Haiti fight gangs and secure routes for international humanitarian aid. But, that being said, no date has actually been set for its deployment, nor has the United Nations ever announced which countries are volunteering contributions. Well, except for one, it seems. Kenya. The reason that we bring up Kenya in this instance is because Kenya actually went and volunteered a thousand police officers in response to Haiti's appeal for international assistance against the violent gangs that had taken over the country. Which is great. It seems that finally, after all this time that the country was collapsing into chaos, that something was actually going to happen and help was going to be given. But this ultimately would end up going nowhere because the High Court of Kenya temporarily would block the Kenyan government's proposal. This was subjected to review by the High Court on the 26th of January 2024, and when that happened, was subsequently rejected. The court decision means that the deployment of police forces to Haiti has been deemed to be illegal. So once again, no help seems to be coming. Which brings us to the current state of Haiti. Haiti is all but collapsing, with no one it seems able or willing to help it. But the question is, really, how exactly did we get here? Again, we are talking about a state that at one point in time was easily the most profitable colony in the entirety of the Americas, and now it is nothing more than a rotting carcass washed up on the shore of a Caribbean island. Well, my friends, in order to understand the fall of Haiti, we're going to need to take a step back in time and look at its rise. Pre-warning before we actually get into all this, we're going to be talking about a lot of things. Racism, natural disasters, corruption, oppression, and so much more. All of these things that tie a beautifully rotten bow over the basket case that is the state of Haiti. And to that end, this is also probably going to be one of the longest videos that I've ever created. Just over the course of researching and writing and creating this thing, it has taken days upon days of research and writing, and I know it's going to take even longer in order to edit this whole thing together for a subject that YouTube has a very high likelihood of being mad about. To that end, it would make it extremely happy if you went ahead and liked this video, and I know that 
that a lot of YouTubers go and say these things like like, comment, and subscribe, but it really does help us in an algorithm that constantly seems to be working against us. So thank you, my friends, for doing your part in the present. And now, let's dive into the past. But my friends, before we get back into today's episode, I would like to thank today's sponsor, Aura, and I would like to ask a simple question to all of you. Do you feel safe on the internet? I know that from the very get-go, that's going to sound like a pretty odd question, but you need to hear me out on this. My friends, I am well aware that a lot of you are using the internet in order to watch this video right now, and have you, by any chance, ever Googled yourself and been shocked to actually find your own personal information that is exposed on one of those public listing sites or anything like that? With both myself and my wife being creators of content on the internet, the internet at times can be a very nasty place and there are a lot of people who have gone against us to say the least. Data brokers are making a fortune selling your information to robocallers, to spammers, and to anyone else who wants to learn more information about you, like where you live. Aura can identify data brokers that are exposing your info and submit opt-out requests on your behalf. Brokers are legally required to remove your info if you ask them to, but they always make it extremely hard to do so in the first place. That is where Aura can come in and handle everything for you, and it is incredibly nice to have. It's incredibly easy to set up. You don't have to download several different apps in order to get things like parent controls, antivirus, VPNs, password management, or literally anything else. You can just get everything at one affordable price altogether. So look, if you want to be taken advantage of on the internet, then that is your choice. But if you want to be able to protect your family, then by all means, go and click the link down in my description and get Aura today. At the same time that we really begin this video, I want you all to keep in mind that what we're going to be talking about here is not just going to be a single isolated incident. Usually when I am talking about historical context for a state and the current ongoing issues that it is facing, you can go and talk about the history of how it came to be, but simultaneously, usually more of the story focuses on one singular aspect. The talk about the collapse of Haiti is not something that is just modern and recent. No, my friends, the collapse of Haiti goes right back to its very foundations in the first place. So I know that off the get-go, this video is going to be long, and I do not even know at the time that I am saying this how long it is going to be, but we are effectively going to have to speed run through the entire broken history of Haiti so you understand just how corrupt and broken of a state this is. Buckle up, my friends, because this is going to get nasty. The story of this history would begin when Spanish settlers would arrive on the island of Hispaniola, which comprises modern-day Haiti and the Dominican Republic, in 1492. Within a quarter century, diseases that were brought by Europeans, such as smallpox and measles, decimated the indigenous Taino population. And so after that, over the next three centuries, European colonizers would import hundreds of thousands of enslaved people from Western and Central Africa in order to harvest sugar, coffee, and timber, all of which were extremely lucrative exports. And when I say the word valuable, I don't think that many people understand just the sheer scope of what I am talking about here and just how important Haiti was. In order to understand that, you really need to look at the numbers. In the year 1789, the French colony of Saint-Dominique, which is the former name of Haiti, was the most successful plantation colony in the entirety of the Americas. It supplied France with around 66% of all of its tropical produce and accounted for 30 3% of French foreign trade. Despite comprising only half of a small island, the population of this colony would eventually grow to around 500,000 people, 80% of which were enslaved. And those, of course, were the ones that were actually alive in all of this. As for what I mean by that, it really is a harsh reality, but over the course of 1680 to 1776, approximately 800,000 Africans were imported to the island, a third of which would end up dying within only the first few years. Sugar plantations at the time needed vast quantities of brutal manual labor in order to produce their product, and due to a combination of these working conditions as well as tropical diseases, these had a tendency to very quickly deplete the imported workforce. And in contrast to the vast quantities of enslaved Africans, the colony was home to only around 30,000 white Europeans, and roughly from that a similar number of Afranchis, which could be freed slaves, or usually was primarily composed of mainly mixed-race people that had their independence and freedom. This means that if you're looking at things population-wise, the rate of enslaved to free was almost 10 to 1, and if you look at it by a matter of race, it's it's more like 20 to 1. This is a massive disparity, and it is something that was inherently very risky for the owners of these plantations. This meant that the owners were always on the lookout for any kind of hint of rebellion, and if they spotted it, or if they even thought that it was there, would brutally oppress their slaves in order to try and mitigate this possibility. Which then, you know, made things pretty awkward when the whole French Revolution actually went and hit. And awkward very quickly then turned into being extremely messy. As we kind of already mentioned here just a moment ago, society and Saint-Dominique was divided 
divided very heavily among both class and color lines, with Afranchis and white people oftentimes at odds in terms of how exactly are we going to interpret the egalitarian language of the French Revolution. It's the whole all men are created equal kind of problem once again. You see, when the revolution broke out in the first place, white elites within society sought greater economic autonomy from France itself. From this, they thought, hey, okay, great, this is a perfect opportunity for us. We no longer are beholden to the crown. We're going to be able to actually govern ourselves more, much in the same way that America had. And by govern ourselves, I mean, of course, the elite plantation owners were going to run everything within society, just as they already kind of did, just with now more legal authority. However, there weren't all that many of these plantation owners, and so working class and poor white people would argue for the equality of, well, anyone who was white, where they themselves would be able to get some of the power as well, not just those who actually had land. In addition to them, Afranchis aspired to have the same amount of power that white people did, and they themselves had begun to amass wealth as landowners themselves, oftentimes with these freed Africans and mixed-race people having their own slaves and plantations. That is the setting into which the French Revolution came into being. So what would happen during this time period, then, is that France would grant almost complete autonomy to Saint-Dominique. There really was no way that they could actually control it in 1790. However, it left open the whole issue of rights for the Afranchis, and the white planters refused to recognize them as equals, which created an extremely volatile situation. You know, in a situation that was already extremely volatile. Because of this, in October of 1790, the Afranchis would lead their first armed revolt against white colonial authorities. In April of 1791, revolts then by enslaved black people would begin to break out, and in the meantime, France would try and extend some rights to the Afranchis, which would anger the white colonists. By the year 1791, everything was effectively in chaos. Enslaved people and freed mulattoes were fighting separately for their own kind of agendas, and the white colonists, on the other hand, were too busy trying to maintain their own hegemony to notice that anything was getting really bad. Over the course of 1791, then, these revolts that we're talking about would grow in numbers and frequency, with enslaved people torching the most prosperous plantation and even killing fellow enslaved people who refused to join in their revolt. Due to the fighting and the chaos and everything that was happening, happening, the French National Assembly would then revoke the decree which granted limited rights to the Afranchis in September of 1791. And this, as you can imagine, would only piss people off more and spur on the rebellion of the Afranchis. That exact same month, enslaved people would respond by burning down one of the colony's most important cities, Le Cap. The following month, the city of Port-au-Prince was burned to the ground as well in fighting between white people and Afranchis. The whole thing was an absolute and giant crap. Shoot. Now, my friends, I'm not going to explain the entirety of the Haitian Revolution. That is probably something that in and of itself deserves an entire other video. But when I say that the Haitian Revolution was extremely chaotic and extremely important to why Haiti has problems today, well, you need to understand what it is that I'm saying. Calling the Haitian Revolution chaotic is like saying that fire is hot. The more colors that you see in that fire, the hotter that it is. That was a science joke right there, and it also probably didn't work very well, but you, you probably get what it is that I mean. When you look at the Haitian Revolution, at one time, there was probably around seven different parties that were warring simultaneously with each other. You had people that were enslaved, you had working class white people, you had Afranchis, you had the wealthier white people, you had the Spanish, who at the same time were invading here, and the English, and also, at the same time, French troops that were involved in the entire situation. At any given point, alliances were temporarily being made between groups, and then very quickly falling apart as soon as there wasn't really a need anymore. As an example of this, in 1792, black slaves and Afranchis went and allied themselves with the British that were fighting against the French, and then in 1793, they allied with the Spanish. The whole thing was absolutely a giant mess, one that very quickly tore the country and its economy apart. Remember that Haiti was a plantation colony. The entire purpose as to why it existed was to be able to grow cash crops and then be able to sell those cash crops. But over the course of the revolution, production would decline so significantly that export agriculture was virtually dead. And how bad was it, you may wonder? Well, let's go ahead and put things into perspective. Well, there were four primary products that Haiti would export at this time. You had sugar, which was very obviously the big one, cotton, indigo, and coffee. If you then look at the differences between 1789 before the revolution and 1795 during, then coffee was down to 2.8% of what it was in 1789 by 1795. Sugar was down even more to one2 2%, and cotton and indigo had fallen to a mere 0.7 and 0.5% respectively of their former levels. This, my friends, was an absolutely catastrophic decline. In what was previously the world's most productive colony, production 
consumption of the four most valuable crops had declined by over 97%, which is really bad, of course, and bad being a very severe understatement when I use that exact word. But what one would normally expect in that scenario is that after the war was over, things would pick up for Haiti again, right? Well, a little, but no, not really. The short of things is that the Haitians would eventually win their independence in what was the first successful slave revolution in the Western Hemisphere, which is big, it definitely is. But at the same time, this brought the entire plantation economy to a complete halt, and it is also possible that over the course of this time period, around 60% of the population that lived in Saint-Dominique in 1789 would then die over the course of 1790 to 1796. We really don't know. What we do know is that everything was basically destroyed. It is into this extremely dire situation that Toussaint Louverture, the hero of the revolution and leader of the Haitians, believed that now that the Haitians were free, he then had to bring back the plantation production and export system in order to be able to preserve the state's new freedom and autonomy. To that end, he would take drastic measures in order to help rebuild the economy, even forcing former slaves to keep working on the plantations that they had literally just been freed from. Naturally, the formerly enslaved people were not very happy with this, and they wanted their own land to small farmers. However, Toussaint Louverture would not allow that, and would use his authority to forcefully put people back to work if necessary. It's one of those reasons when we talk about this that Toussaint Louverture is actually one of the more complex figures in history, whereas people nowadays have a tendency to think of him as just a hero, but the reality is more complicated than that. Now, forcing people to go back and work on the plantations that they were freshly freed from may have seemed like a new form of slavery, but Toussaint would insist that these kinds of sacrifices were necessary to preserve liberty rather than just simply destroy it. And as for why he did this, well, Toussaint would refuse to break up the plantations because he did understand that the entire economy of Haiti was dependent upon these plantations, and that if he broke them up into small scattered land holdings, then they would not actually be able to implement the plantation economy that was going to bring money in for the state in the first place. The evil of plantations were necessary, because without a plantation economy at this time, there was going to be no wealth to actually maintain the army that was necessary in order to be able to preserve the independence of the state in the first place. But in the end, that wouldn't necessarily really matter for Louverture, because eventually he would be captured and killed, and his successor was then going to have to take things into his own hands to be able to create Haiti. And oh boy, did he. Over the course of the revolution, after declaring independence, the successor of Louverture, Jean-Jacques de Salonay, would take the French flag and actually go and cut out the white third of the flag, the tricolor that it had. This was something that was supposed to symbolize the destruction and removal of whiteness in Haiti. The red and blue parts of the flag were then put back together, and that is actually the story behind the creation of the modern Haitian flag. If that sounds kind of weird and a little bit ominous, then yes, you are right, because immediately what would happen and in following independence is that de Salonay's forces would then massacre the remaining white residents of Haiti, which would create a horrible first impression for the new nation. He would round up any other remaining French citizens that were all over Haiti, even ones that had actually fought for Haitian independence in the first place, and would slaughter them. The act of doing this would effectively ruin any opportunity for Haiti to be able to establish any meaningful productive relationships with other nations. Relationships that Toussaint had known that they would need after in independence. Due to these brutal and hostile actions, the major powers of the world refused to recognize the nation of Haiti. Haiti was not going to be able to establish diplomatic relationships with other nations, it couldn't establish treaties, it couldn't make any kind of trade agreements, you know, the things that are actually necessary in order to have a functioning economy in the first place. And furthermore, the world powers would then initiate a boycott and embargo of the nation, which would leave Haiti, after destroying much of its society, politically and economically isolated from the rest of the world. America, which was the major power that was actually close by, for years wanted absolutely nothing to do with Haiti, because, go figure, a successful slave revolt that is quite literally in your backyard is not good when half of your country still utilizes slave labor, and you don't want people to get any ideas. So okay, what's next then? Well, several other leaders would come along in Haiti, and we're not going to be going through all of them. In short, what would happen is that they got rid of the plantation system, they finally allowed common people to go and actually get their own land, and when this happened, sugar production all but disappeared in the former colony. The government then panicked and tried to bring back forced labor on plantations and stop small farming, but none of that really worked very well, and it pissed off so many people that it would lead to multiple revolts. 
The economy would effectively stagnate during this time period. And on top of all of that, on top of all the trouble that they were facing, in order to remove their diplomatic isolation, Haiti would eventually agree to pay an indemnity to France for the cost of France losing its colony and slaves. Yes, my friends, that is right. For those who are unaware, essentially what had to happen here is that Haitians were forced to pay money to their former owners as punishment for freeing themselves. In addition to the value of the lost real estate, France would impose the indemnity in the amount of 150 million francs payable over the course of five years in which the French government would calculate as a decade of Haitian revenue. And it is really hard to describe the sheer level at to which this debt completely crippled Haiti. The debt that we're talking about here was such a massive burden that it was going to completely weigh down the nation as it would try to grow, to the point that Haiti really wasn't able to grow. In fact, Haiti was unable to make its first 30 million franc payment, and so the Haitian government had to incur more debt instead. The Haitian government would ultimately borrow funds from French banks at an interest rate of over 25% or even higher in order to try and make the indemnity payments in the first place. And this would start the cycle of Haiti's long history of being indebted to foreign nations, which would result in many different foreign powers getting involved in Haiti's financial affairs over the years. The loans that we're talking about here would only exacerbate Haiti's already pre-existing issues with their finances. In previous years, more than 50% of the Haitian budget had gone to the military, this being courtesy of the authoritarian measures that the government had to use in order to be able to force people onto the plantations to pay for said military in the first place. But as I said, this would only get worse because following the indemnity, debt payments would comprise as much as 80% of the entire Haitian budget. This policy would effectively be the final blow to the Haitian economy that was already in dire straits in the first place. With such a massive percentage of the budget every single year having to leave the country as debt payments, this meant that any kind of real investment that the government could have put into its own infrastructure, into its own economy, into anything, became impossible. The debt essentially meant that Haiti was deprived of all resources that it could possibly use in order to get itself out of its hole in the first place. Haiti was, unfortunately, largely broke. And so because of this, the French and Haitian governments would eventually renegotiate the indemnity down to around 60 million francs in 1838, but even when this happened, the debt was still something that was way beyond Haiti's means to actually pay for. If you're wondering just how much money we're talking about here, modern historians, when looking at this amount, would judge the indemnity to be approximately 21 billion US dollars today, which is a lot, but it's made worse by the fact that Haiti's GDP today is essentially that exact same amount, meaning that the debt that they had to take on in the 1800s was the same as what it is over 150 years later. As a result, it wasn't actually until the year 1947 that Haiti was ever actually to pay off this debt. Debt. That is 122 years worth of debt payments. And so yeah, the unfortunate reality was that Haiti was a broken state from the very beginning. Politically, socially, economically, all of this was going to be bad, and this that I'm talking about is just the beginning in order to set the stage. The state of Haiti was never exactly really stable, and in 1843 a revolt was going to overthrow the government and establish a brief parliamentary rule system under the Constitution of 1843. This, however, was not exactly going to last, and more revolts would soon break out, which would cause the country to descend into further chaos, with a series of short ruling presidents until March 1847, when General Faustin Soleke, a former slave who had actually fought in the original rebellion of 1791, is the guy who would become president. Now the image that I have behind me here I know is going to look a little bit weird, especially since I just said the words president, but yes, the reason why you are seeing this guy in his regal attire here, like a king, is because in 18 1849, taking advantage of just how popular he was, President Faustin Silike would proclaim himself as Emperor Faustin I. He would do this before Napoleon III was ever actually able to do that in France himself. So, you know, Haiti would uh, precede its former colonial master in that regard. His harsh rule would succeed in uniting Haiti for a brief time, but this would ultimately come to a very abrupt end in 1859, when he, in turn, was deposed by General Fabre Jaffard. So yeah, multiple overthrows of the government is never exactly a good thing, but Jaffard's military government would manage to hold office until 1867. And over the course of that time period, he would encourage a rather 
rather successful policy of national reconciliation. In 1860, he reached an agreement with the Vatican, which would reintroduce official Roman Catholic institutions, including schools, back into the nation. And in 1867, an attempt was made to try and establish a constitutional government, but it didn't exactly work out. The presidents that would follow him would end up being overthrown in 1869 and 1874, respectively. At least after this, a more workable constitution was then introduced under Miquel Domingue in 1874, which, once that would happen, would lead to a relatively long period of time of democracy within Haiti, where the state was actually able to transition peacefully and freely and simultaneously would grow economically. As the late 1800s rolled around and mechanization arrived in the country, the development of industrial sugar and rum industries near Port-au-Prince would actually make Haiti, for a while, somewhat wealthy, at least relative to what it previously had been. But this period of relative stability and prosperity would ultimately end in the year 1911, when revolution would break out in the country, and once more, everything would just slide into absolute chaos, and the state would once again find itself deep in debt. Now, you may wonder when I talk about this, just what kind of chaos am I talking about here? I mean, it's not like Haiti has already not been chaotic in and of itself. Well, yeah, we're talking Mexican Revolution levels of chaos. From the year 1911 to 1915, there were six different presidents of Haiti, each of which was either killed or forced into exile, which was definitely not a stable situation in any way, shape, or form. All over the countryside of Haiti, there were revolutionary armies that were being formed by Cacos, which were essentially peasant brigands from the mountains in the north that were all along the Dominican border, who in turn were being promised by different political groups that they would be paid lots of money if they helped these varying different political factions and candidates to win power themselves. In addition to that, they would also be offered a lot of plunder, but ultimately that wasn't really going to be able to happen. Meanwhile, as all of this is going down, as Haiti is quite literally tearing itself apart, Europe was of course at war and also tearing itself apart. And Germany at this time in 1915 was actually doing pretty decently, all things considered. The fear that the US president, Woodrow Wilson, had was that Germany might end up actually taking over Haiti in order to be able to establish a military base there, which is something that in turn would threaten the Panama Canal, something that was a key lifeline for the United States. And to be fair, he actually did have some justification for this thought. There were actually a number of German settlers in Haiti who were relatively wealthy, and from this had financed the Kakos with loans that, well, they really had no hope of ever actually repaying. And some of these settlers were begging Germany to please invade and restore order to the country. The US, of course, could not let that happen, and so they just kind of did it themselves. After years of chaos, President Woodrow Wilson would order Marines to Haiti in 1915, which was supposed supposed to be for the purpose of restoring political stability. During the nearly two-decade operation, though, the United States would control Haiti's security and finances. At the same time that it would stabilize the country, it would also impose racial segregation. It would force labor. It would institute press censorship. It would depose any presidents or legislatures that would oppose U.S. presence. During this time period, approximately 15,000 Haitians ended up being killed in varying rebellions against the United States, which the bloodiest of these would occur over the course of 1919 and 1929. Not exactly a clean situation. Although not pleasant, over this time period, the United States would at least stabilize the country. And as the Great Depression would hit over the course of the 1930s, they then ultimately would prepare to leave. The transition government that was left would at least have better infrastructure. It would have more public health, education, and also agricultural and industrial development, as well as a democratic system. But at the same time, it came at the cost of years of oppression. The country would ultimately have fully democratic elections in 1930, which were won by an individual by the name of Stenio Vincent, who would later become the president, and after this, President Franklin D. Roosevelt would withdraw U.S. troops in 1934 as part of the good neighbor policy. Now, I already know that I'm going to be seeing a number of comments in the comment section that are going to be saying things like I skipped over a lot of the stuff with the U.S. occupation, and I did. That is definitely something that on its own would probably deserve its own video, but you get the idea of what it is that I'm talking about, and I can't sit behind on this forever because we got to move into more more important things. Because ultimately, the U.S. occupation of Haiti was pretty much just a case study, as this was going to end up being a repeating cycle with the state. It would eventually achieve stability, but this is something that was always done through oppression. And Stenio here, um, yeah, he was ultimately going to be no different. After the United States would withdraw from the country, Vincent would take advantage of things by expanding his economic authority by referendum. In 1935, he would force a new 
constitution through the legislature, effectively achieving dictatorial power. This constitution would give him the power to dissolve the legislature and reorganize the judiciary system at will, as well as the power to appoint senators. Meaning, yes, he could get rid of the legislature, he could appoint senators to replace people within it, and then completely override anything that he wanted to do with the judges by simply reorganizing the system in the first place. Combined with that, he would also brutally oppress any political opposition. Meanwhile, as all of that is going down in Haiti, next door in the Dominican Republic, Rafael Leonidas Trujillo had just come to power in 1930. In 1937, he would actually go and attack the border with Haiti, with his forces killing an approximate 20,000 Haitians. Instead of Vincent thinking that this was something that was the attack of a foreign power, which it was, he believed that instead this whole thing was a massive complex orchestration of a coup attempt against himself and would use the opportunity to instead purge the military of all officers that he suspected of being disloyal. Because, of course. Things would at least start to change a little bit, as if you fast forward a few years, in 1941, you had a man called Eli Lescott, who was a mulatto government official, who was elected as president. And at first, this guy actually did seem to be pretty competent and a genuinely good leader for Haiti. But despite high expectations, he would rule pretty much in the exact same way as Vincent and was brutal towards any opposition. How brutal, you may wonder? Well, remember at this time, there's a little event that's going on in the early 1940s, uh, World War II. Well, what this guy would do to take advantage of the entire situation is that he would declare war on the Axis powers. And then he would use this as a justification in order to be able to censor the press and repress any political opponents that went against him as being supporters of the enemy. Would he do anything to actually help the war efforts? Well, not not really, they wouldn't actually do all that much. The only thing that Haiti ever really did over the course of the war was provide raw materials to the Allies and allow the United States to use it as a shipping base. That That's really it, they didn't actually do anything. The whole thing was literally just done to oppress his political opponents. Naturally, of course, this was going to piss off a lot of people. And in January of 1946, after Lescott would jail editors of a Marxist newspaper, protests would then break out among government workers, among teachers, and business owners all across the country. Lescott would ultimately resign and a military junta would then go and take power. So yeah, once again, absolute beacon of stability. Haiti would actually end up electing a legislature in May of 1946, and after two rounds of voting, de Marseille Estime, who was a black cabinet minister, was elected as president. And when I'm talking about him, this guy was actually pretty interesting. He operated under a new constitution which expanded schools, he established rural farming cooperatives, he raised salaries among civil servants, and really, when we're talking about changes and things that are happening in Haiti, for a time, this was some really positive stuff that was happening. But, of course, again, like all things with Haiti, it was not to last. The unfortunate thing is that Estime would would fall victim eventually to what would destroy many Haitian rulers and politicians, elites with grudges against them, and also the fact that he had too much personal ambition. In the case of the elites, they had a lot of grudges because not only had Estime largely excluded them from varying positions within the government, where they could, you know, make some serious corrupt money, but also he did something horrible. He enacted the country's first income tax. Combine that with helping the growth of labor unions and suggesting that voodoo was the equal of Roman Catholicism, and you got a bunch of very pissed off elites. Officers in the military were reached out to, and in combination with all of the deteriorating domestic issues that were going on in the country, this would then lead to a coup in May of 1950, which would, once again, reinstall the military junta. Direct elections, the first ever that would occur in Haiti's history, were held in October of 1950 then, and Paul Maglor, an elite black colonel in the military, was the person who would end up winning the election. And now this, my friends, would then be followed by the first great natural disaster that Haiti would face over the course of the 20th century that we are going to to talk about, something that would bring the country to its knees again and again and again with different iterations. Hurricane Hazel would hit the island in 1954, which would absolutely devastate the nation's infrastructure and economy. Hurricane relief was inadequately distributed, and much of it was misspent by corrupt government officials. Maglore, during this time, would jail opponents and shut down newspapers that questioned his rule, and after refusing to step down after his term ended, a general strike would ultimately shut down Port-au-Prince's economy. Maglore would ultimately flee the country, and this would in turn leave the government in an absolute state of chaos. Things were not looking good for Haiti, and when elections were finally organized, the winner of it was going to make things even worse. Francois Duvalier, a rural doctor, was elected, and he was elected on a platform of activism on behalf of Haiti's poor. This was going to be a decision that many people were going to come to regret. 
Like the many Haitian leaders that had come before him, Duvalier, a.k.a. Papa Doc, would produce his own constitution that would allow him to solidify his power. In 1961, he proceeded to violate the provisions of that constitution that he made, which had gone in effect in 1957. He replaced the bicameral legislature with a unicameral body and decreed presidential and legislative elections. Despite a 1957 prohibition against presidential re-election, Duvalier would run for office, and when he would do so, would win with an official vote of, can you guess it, 1,320,748 votes to zero. Because of course. Despite the overwhelming popular support that he seemed to enjoy, for some reason it meant that Duvalier was not willing to take up the risk of another election that could come after, and so like many presidents before him, he would declare himself president president for life. At this point, when we're talking about political instability and dictatorships within Haiti, yeah, this had happened something along the lines of seven times before this. Like, seven different people had also claimed that same title. As time would go on within Haiti, things would only deteriorate further. And after a coup attempt, the president would then sack the armed forces chief of staff and replace him with someone who was more reliable, aka more loyal. This action would help him to expand the presidential palace army unit into a presidential guard that would serve directly under him. The guard is something that would become the elite core of the Haitian army, and its sole purpose was specifically to maintain Duvalier's power. After having taken things over within the military, Duvalier would then go on to dismiss the entire general staff and replace all of the aging Marine-trained officers that were there since the U.S. intervention days with younger men who would owe their positions entirely to Duvalier, creating a loyal army class that specifically was only under him. It seems, though, that taking over the military was not enough, and so Duvalier would further blunt the power of the army through the formation of his own rural militia, called the Volunteers for National Security but from that, more commonly referred to as the Tonton Makots. I'm probably horribly mispronouncing that when I say this, but the term that we're talking about here is specifically something that derives from the Creole term for the boogeyman, essentially. Within two years of establishing this paramilitary group that would serve directly under him, this group would actually outnumber the army by over two to one. These would be the forces that would effectively serve as the secret police and enforcers of Duvalier's rule. If the army protected things within the city and internationally, then the Tontons were going to make sure that everyone out in the countryside stayed loyal to him or suffered the consequences. And so it was then that after completely breaking the power of the military and establishing his own type of security force, that Duvalier was able to utilize corruption and intimidation in order to create his own elite people within the country to be able to serve under him. Corruption in the form of bribery, extortion of domestic businesses, stolen government funds, etc., all of these things would be done in order to be able to enrich the people that were closest to the dictator. This way, they would actually have the wealth and power to be able to support him, and simultaneously would make them very happy to do so. If it was possible, anyone who could flee the country would do so during this time, which in turn would lead to a massive exodus of the brightest minds within the country, much in the same way as what happened when Castro took over things in Cuba. Duvalier's rule was something that specifically operated on terror. It was how it ran. And over that time period, approximately 30,000 Haitians were killed for political reasons during his rule. At the time of his death in 1971, Francois Duvalier would then designate his son, Jean-Claude Duvalier, as Haiti's new leader. Under this new Duvalier, also known as Baby Doc in comparison to his father's Papa Doc, Haiti's economic and political condition would only continue to decline. Although, at the very least when we are talking about this, some of the more insane and brutal elements of his father's regime were at least abolished. There weren't nearly as many mass killings so to speak. And because of this, the United States would ultimately restore its aid program in 1971, but things didn't really get better for the state. You see, my friends, it's going to sound absolutely crazy, but in comparison to Papa Doc, Baby Doc didn't actually want to rule the country. He just wanted all the wealth and power that actually came with ruling. And so, content to leave administrative matters of actually, you know, operating the country in the hands of mother, Simone Ovid Duvalier, he went on to live life as a playboy. Baby Doc would go on to enrich himself through a series of fraudulent schemes, and much of the Duvalier's wealth, amounting to hundreds of millions of dollars, would end up coming from the Rige du Tabac, the Tobacco Administration. This being a tobacco monopoly that had been established by Estime, which would expand to include the proceeds of just about every single kind of government enterprise that you can imagine. 
And since Baby Doc went and operated everything within the government, this means that all the funds from all those varying sources within the government would run through here, and he would have it serve as a kind of slush fund, one in which no balance sheets were ever actually kept, so they had no idea where the money ever went to. Naturally, of course, this is a very bad thing, and blatant theft and corruption with the government meant that the regime was particularly sensitive and fragile if anything ever really went wrong. And as this is Haiti, can you guess what happened? Everything went wrong. Over the course of the 1980s, there were many bad things that would happen in 80, but widespread poverty in the country was made only worse by an epidemic of African swine fever virus, which would lead to the slaughter of the Creole pigs that was one of the key sources of income for many Haitians. And at the same time that a pig virus was effectively destroying the country economically, the AIDS virus, which was a big thing that was happening in the United States, was also proceeding to wreak havoc throughout the country, a problem that still persists to this very day. And as all of this is going down, as discontent is building and building and building across the country, in 1983, Pope John Paul II comes to town and he condemns the regime of Duvalier in a visit, stating, and I quote, things must change in Haiti. He would call upon, quote, all those who have in power, riches, and culture so that they can understand the serious and urgent responsibility to help their brothers and sisters. Over the course of the time period that he was there, he would call for a more equal distribution of income, a more egalitarian social structure, and simultaneously increase popular participation in public life. The message was something that was received by just about everyone in the country, whether they were a member of the clergy or just one of the average citizens. This would become a rallying cry for the people of Haiti, and it would finally provoke a rebellion. In February of 1986, after months and months of disorder, the army would ultimately force Duvalier to resign and go into exile. Haiti had once again lost another dictator. And of course, what was then going to happen is that Haiti was once more going to be put right back into the situation that it always seemed to start with, needing to elect a new democratic government and establishing a new constitution, again in 1987. Haiti would then have its first free and fair elections in the year 1990, in which Jean-Bertrand Aristide, who was a former Catholic priest, would end up being elected as president. Which is awesome, but then you remember that this is Haiti, and so of course nothing is really meant to last. In 1991, the Haitian military would overthrow Aristide in a coup, which was just eight months after he had been inaugurated. Aristide would then go into exile in the United States, and three years later, under threat of a U.S military intervention, the military would finally bow to international pressure and allow Arstead to come back and finish his term. He would ultimately return to Haiti in 1994 under the protection of around 20,000 United States troops, which would then transfer responsibility to a United Nations mission over the course of 1995. With U.S. assistance, President Arstead would disband the army and then over this time would begin to train a professional civilian police force. At least, it seems at this point, things for Haiti looked a little bit up, because in 1996, the Haitian would see their first peaceful transfer of power between two democratically elected presidents in Haitian history, this being when Aristide would be succeeded by René Préval. And then, weirdly enough, five years later in 2001, Aristide was actually re-elected, and there was another peaceful transfer of power, which was a really big deal for Haiti. As you can probably imagine, though, considering that we're talking about Haiti, this was not going to last. Political conflict would end up breaking out between Aristide and the opposition, and this would lead to the collapse of his government in 2004. Eventually, Aristide would go into exile and end up in South Africa, and an interim government would follow from 2004 to 2006. The really unfortunate thing that would happen to Haiti because of all this, because of the charges of corruption that would be leveled against Aristide, because of the disillusion of the parliament by Preval in his first term, and because people were questioning whether or not the interim government was even legitimate at all, because, you know, there were a lot of flawed elections and everything that was happening at this time, this just meant that no one could ever really trust or fully accept the government in the first place at this time in the early to mid-2000s. Still though, with the support of the United Nations Stabilization Mission for Haiti, which would arrive to Haiti in 2004, conditions would at least improve within the country, and reform of the country's police force would begin, and elections would be held in 2006. As a result of those elections, the parliament, which, mind you, had not been functional since the collapse of Aristide's government back in 2004, that was re-established, and René Preval would then begin his second five-year term as president. So it went from Arstead to Preval, and back to Arstead, and back to Preval. It's, it, this is the whole thing of how Hayden works in the first place. Either way, for the first three years that he was in office, Preval would actually establish a relative level of stability within the country. And during this time, all the way going into the late 2000s, there would be a 
period of economic growth and stability within the country. And then the disasters hit. Now, my friends, in order to talk about this, we're going to be going back a little bit in time, but you need to understand that in order to talk about Haiti, you have to talk about disasters. That's just the reality of things. You could say that talking about Haiti is talking about disasters. The first one that we're going to mention here is Hurricane Jean, which would hit back on September 25th, 2004, and at least 3,000 people ended up being killed by this, and another 250,000 Haitians were left homeless. Flooding during this time would destroy much of the key rice and fruit harvest of the country. Fast forward another year, and in 2005, in July, Hurricane Dennis would kill 56 people, which was a lot less, but it would cause an additional $50 million in damages, something that Haiti at this point very could ill afford, and it would slide further into debt. In 2007, in the face of this rising debt, the Preval administration would publish its Poverty Reduction Strategy, which was a key step that it needed to meet for the International Monetary Fund in order to get debt relief from them. International donors would pledge more than $1.5 billion in economic assistance to Haiti at this time, but it wasn't really enough. In the spring of 2008, Haitians would go on to demonstrate against rising food prices that were wreaking havoc across the country. In a country that was so poor, one has to understand that Haiti, despite all of the agriculture that it produces, imports the majority of its food. In some instances, the few main roads on the island ended up being blocked with burning tires, and the airport at Port-au-Prince was closed. And into that massive chaotic mix, four storms, Tropical Storm Fay, Hurricane Gustav, Hurricane Hannah, and Hurricane Ike all would hit Haiti over a period of like just a couple months, and it would produce massive amounts of heavy winds and rain in Haiti. The combined effect of this wind and flooding would cause destruction of not only infrastructure such as roads, bridges, and power lines, but simultaneously it would destroy private residences, public buildings, hospitals, churches, and schools, with the disasters resulting in around 548 people being wounded, 793 dead, 310 reported missing, and another 27,000 homes being destroyed, 84,000 being partially damaged, and 800,000 people being affected. This is an event that would occur before the major earthquake that everyone is familiar with when talking about Haitian history. In the aftermath of these events, a post-disaster needs assessment, or PDNA, was undertaken to identify immediate needs for rehabilitation and reconstruction, and develop a detailed work program in order to try and help the country. Total damages and losses due to the disaster was estimated at 897 million US dollars, which was the equivalent of almost 15% of Haiti's entire GDP at this time. Some later estimates, which would raise the amount of damages, would put losses at about 25% of Haiti's GDP being wiped at this point. And if you think that is bad, well, again, it's Haiti, so it's only going to get worse. Because that's right, my friends, we're talking about the earthquake. On the 12th of January 2010 in Port-au-Prince, Haiti would suffer a devastating earthquake of a magnitude of 7.0 with a death toll that was estimated by the Haitian government at the time to be over 300,000 people. Non-Haitian sources would put the numbers at anywhere between 50,000 to 200,000, but either way, the amount of death that would occur during this event was truly staggering. In the aftershocks that would follow, one of these would register at a magnitude of 5.9 and another at 5.5, in and of themselves veritably strong quakes. The capital city of Port-au-Prince was effectively leveled during this time. A million Haitians were left homeless, with hundreds of thousands of them starving. The earthquake would cause massive devastation, with most buildings just completely crumbling. And the enormous death toll that would be caused by this event would make it necessary to just bury the dead in mass graves. Access to clean water and sanitation were severely compromised, and this would in turn lead to a serious outbreak of cholera, which would affect over 6% of the population, causing thousands of more lives to be lost. All told, when you look at the damages that this earthquake caused in the end, this is anywhere, by some estimates, to be between 7 and $14 billion. Which is a lot, because you have to think that at the time when this occurs, Haiti's entire GDP was just under $12 billion. Potentially, that earthquake did more damage to the country than the entire country was able to produce in terms of wealth. In the aftermath of the 2010 earthquake, there really was no access to electricity all over the country. Roads were completely blocked with debris, and communications were down everywhere. There really was no way to do anything with anyone, anyhow, any way. This would make it in turn extremely difficult for any aid organizations from inside the country that were still somehow managing to function, and more importantly, outside of the country, to be able to provide any kind of urgent support that was necessary for families who were suffering. But still, 
the country had to continue to go on and elections were coming up once again. And that, my friends, is when this guy would come into play. On April 4th, 2011, Haiti would go and announce that Mikhail Martelli, also known by his stage name, Sweet Mickey, who was a former musician, had won the election. The election that we're talking about here is extremely questionable in the first place as there were many, many cases, it seems, of voter suppression and other methods of rigging the entire thing. And this is an issue that would go on to plague his presidency as being a kind of mixed bag. Because yes, on one hand, this guy and his associates were accused of being involved in money laundering and many, many other crimes that would result in countless demonstrations by people that would oftentimes become violent in the country as things within Haiti were slowly descending into chaos. But at the same time, under this guy's administration, he was also quite productive. The majority of those who were left homeless following Quake were given housing. He would go on to offer free education programs to large amounts of Haiti's youth, as well as income support support for Haitian mothers and students. The administration would also go on to launch massive reconstruction programs involving government buildings, public places, parks, anything that they could do to both stimulate the economy and getting things back and running again. With one of the biggest factors that he really tried to push being to try and bring tourism back to the country, something that in recent years had fallen considering the amount of destruction that they had faced, but this was going to be a vital lifeline that Haiti needed to bring back. So yeah, he did try to do a lot of things but also was probably horribly corrupt, which is kind of a common thing for Haiti at this point. And unfortunately, at the same time, we are once again going to go right back into square one, as this just seems to be, again, the repeating cycle that we are faced with Haiti. His policies would end up stalling amidst frequent clashes with Parliament, and after being unable to agree to a date for a general election, Parliament would end up expiring in January of 2015, as the terms of most of the members who operated with the government ended at that time. This meant that Martelli had no actual legislators that would work under him. They would actually work in order to be able to make legislation for the country. As a result, he would rule by executive order, almost like a dictator, something that would draw a lot of criticism. When you combine that with the fact that many of his staff members that were running the country in the first place were accused of crimes such as, you know, embezzling money and also murder in some cases, and you have a lot of people that are really questioning what this regime is doing. Because of things like this, Martelli was constitutionally barred from seeking a second term, and so the country had to hold a presidential election that was then held in October of 2015, something that would be completely colored by accusations of fraud, as the candidate that he supported, who was a very little-known businessman, ended up placing first. After protests went and delayed a runoff vote, Martelli would agree to let the recently installed parliament instead select an interim president, and he just left office February 7th, 2016 with literally no successor that was actually in charge at that point. And so it is here, my friends, that I would normally say that we would begin to see the decline of Haiti. But for those of you who have stuck around over the course of the entire video, you would understand that after everything that we have talked about, the entire country has been a massive roller coaster of a ride with way too many drops already. There really has been no decline of Haiti. It was just always seemingly in a case of spiraling. Still though, what we were talking about with the constitutional crisis of Martelli is is the very thing that would lead us directly into the beginning of the crisis today. In the aftermath of the president stepping down with no real successor, the entire country was thrown into a kind of political vacuum over the course of 2016. When fraud allegations were given against the successor of Martelli, Hovenel Moyes, this would in turn postpone Moyes' official election until early 2017. The election that we're talking about here was something that was never going to give any kind of real sense of stability or certainty, as electoral turnout during it was ridiculously low, at less than 22% of eligible voters voting. But either way, Moyes was then sworn in nonetheless on the 7th of February, 2017. Considering the very limited vote that had put him into power in the first place, and also the fact that there was now a question of how long he was actually supposed to serve, like how long the presidential term was going to be, this is something that over the course of his years of ruling would only lead to increased public unrest. As I'm pretty sure we've already mentioned in here several times before, Haiti's presidents governed for five terms. And because the predecessor of Moise, Martelli, had stepped down in 2016, many Haitians thought that Moise was going to only rule until 2021. But the new president was going to go and insist that his term was not going to finish in February of 2021. No, it was actually going to be five years after he took 
office officially in February of 2022. Now, I'm not gonna go and debate the legality of that or what my actual opinion on it was, but either way, this is something that was once again going to throw the entire country into crisis as people did not know what to believe. Over the course of Moise's presidency, mass protests would be seen all across the country, with people calling for his resignation in response to varying different issues that Hay would face, including increasing fuel prices and also the removal of government subsidies that were needed to maintain even a bare minimum of livelihood within the country. Combine these with the classic accusations of corruption and the worsening economic crisis that the country was facing, and from that, you have a recipe for disaster. Violent anti-government protests throughout the country would intensify as time would go on, these being things that would bubble up out of pre-existing grievances that people already had with the state regarding the terrible corruption and electoral fraud. Matters would only get worse during this time, as during his term, President Moise would effectively rule by decree, further undermining the nation's democratic system. He refused to organize elections in 2018 and 2019, considering the destabilized state that the country was already in, meaning that the terms for most of Haiti's democratically elected legislators and mayors would end up expiring in January of 2020 with literally no one to replace them. So once more, Haiti would not have a parliament. It just seems to be something that continuously happens with the state. But Moise's popularity would get even worse after his unconstitutional appointment of Dr. Ariel Henry as prime minister, a guy who was never backed nor formally ratified or anything by the Haitian National Assembly because the National Assembly by this point, had ceased to exist. There was no actual members because their terms had expired. Combine the natural disaster issues, the political issues, and the fact that COVID-19 had effectively shut down the global economy for several years right around this time, when Haiti needs it to not do that, and you have a massive pile of crap on your hand. And then, I'm sure, as many of you are aware, Moise gets assassinated, and that crap that was sitting there really hits the fan. In the early hours of July 7th, gunmen would burst into the Port-au-Prince home of the the Haitian president, killing him and critically injuring his wife. The identities of the assailants that we're talking about here and the planners of the assassination are still to this day unknown. We do not know exactly who did this or organized it, although four suspects would end up getting killed in a shootout with the police and many more would end up arrested. Haiti's interim prime minister, Claude Joseph, would then declare a state of siege and would after this impose martial law, closing the borders. In fact, oh my God, guys, this is actually crazy. I'm gonna have to insert a little bit of a break in this video. I'm literally making this video here today and I was just checking back on this and there was an update in the last 24 hours, at the time that I am filming this, that says that, quote, widow of Haiti's former president among those indicted from his assassination. The wife of Haiti's former president, Jovenel Moyes, Martin Moyes, and the former prime minister, Claude Joseph, are among 51 people who've been indicted over the assassination of the former president, according to a 122-page document from the judge presiding over the investigation. Are you freaking kidding me after literally everything that I was doing? Oh. In the document dated January 25th and made public by the online Haitian news site on Monday, which was, you know, yesterday, the time that I'm making this, Judge Walter Wesser Voltaire said that Mrs. Moyes conspired with the former prime minister to replace the president. The 51 people named in the indictment are facing charges ranging from complicity and criminal association, armed robbery, terrorism, assassination, and crimes committed to the prejudice of former President Jovenel Moyes, it said. The order claims there is serious and sufficient evidence against those mentioned. This is uh, th this is absolute insanity. Now, naturally speaking, when I'm talking about this, I'm not going to put the entirety of this article. If you want to go and find this article itself, I will link this more than likely in the description. But uh, naturally speaking, the widow of the former president is very upset that she's been accused of murdering her husband and is saying that all of this was just, you know, some kind of political scapegoat by the incompetent government that can't actually seem to get its crap together. Yeah, in a statement following the release of the order of the former prime minister, Claude Joseph denied his involvement in the assassination and accused the Prime Minister Ariel Henry of weaponizing the Haitian justice system. I would love to see the evidence that they actually have of this entire thing because considering everything, again, that we have covered over the course of this video, you all understand that the justice and legal system within Haiti is not exactly something that um, performs the best in the first place. So you can understand why I would say to take the article and the statements of the government here with a grain of salt. And as it says here in the end, Haiti has faced a surge in gang-related violence 
violence in recent years, which has cut off vital supply chains and forced some 200,000 people to flee their homes in the capital of Port-au-Prince. Earlier this month, Henry urged calm after three days of violent protest, demanding him to step down as frustration grows over gang violence, poverty, and his failure to organize general elections. Yeah, we're going to be getting into that. So yes, just as Henry used the assassination of the president in order to be able to ascend to the office of president himself, outside of the National Palace, gangs have very quickly capitalized on the sheer amount of instability within the state in order to be able to entrench themselves in the capital city and impose their own kind of rule over the country's economic infrastructure. In fact, you can only see a few of them here on this map, but it's currently estimated that around 100 gangs are operating in the capital city itself, with two large coalitions, G9 and and G Pep largely vying for control between themselves, especially in hotspots such as the Cité Soleil neighborhood. And all of that is creating significantly more trouble for the people that are still trapped within the capital. As an example, the main road that connects Port-au-Prince to the southern peninsula is consistently blocked and monitored by gang squads that use the opportunity to be able to try and kidnap people as well as steal any supplies that they can. And it's really scary because these gangs actually exert quite a lot of influence in the region, and in some cases, have even tried to make political moves themselves. As an example of this, in September of 2022, in order to protest and demand the resignation of Ariel Henry following his decision to cut fuel subsidies, something that would cause energy prices to double within the country, the gang G9 would blockade Haiti's primary fuel terminal at Vero by digging trenches and littering shipping containers all over the area. 10 million gallons of diesel and gasoline and over 800,000 gallons of kerosene ended up being blocked off as a result. The reason this is so bad is that most of the businesses and hospitals in this area in Haiti heavily rely on diesel generators in order to be able to power their buildings. Electricity supplies within Haiti are never exactly reliable, and gangs doing this is something that would threaten their means of accessing this power. The situation was obviously very bad, and yet it still took police two months to be able to act before they would storm the oil depot in November in order to clear out G9 and reinstate fuel supplies. The funny thing though, the gang's leader, Jimmy Jarosin, there, who is actually a former police officer who goes by the moniker of Barbecue, he would actually announce that the termination of the blockade was something that was ordered by his hand after negotiating with the government. And considering everything that has been happening here so far, no one can actually tell who is really telling the truth. The crazy thing about all of this is that it's no secret among Haitians that Barbecue's long-term objective is the ascension into political office, whether that is by legitimate means or otherwise. And he is not the only one. In order to maintain control in the immediate climate, gangs regulate the general population through a number of different fear campaigns, these being things that are maintained in different ways. Kidnappings are alarmingly common, but also at the same time very effective. You're not exactly going to go against the people that currently are holding one of your loved ones hostage. Rival gang members will kidnap civilians in order to try and fund their own operations due to ransom money that they can get from middle class families. Whether this is in the value of merely a couple hundred dollars or thousands of dollars, that remains depending upon the person. Over the course of 2022, it is estimated that around 1,300 kidnappings would occur and over 2,100 murders. And all of this is made significantly worse because of a significant increase in the inflow of illegal firearms and ammunition. Mind you, when we were talking about this, the arms are typically not coming from Haiti itself, as Haiti does not manufacture its own firearms. Instead, the majority of weapons and ammunition are procured abroad, with a number of these specifically coming from the United States that are purchased and then illegally sold down into Haiti. Occasionally, firearms and ammunition are routed to Haiti via the Dominican Republic, which is able to happen due to the many different porous border crossings between the two countries. Illicit substances, weapons, and cash also arrive via regular flights into secret airstrips. Seizures by Haitian and U.S. authorities reveal an increasing number of high-caliber firearms that are destined for Haiti from the United States. Over the course of 2023, thousands of more people were killed in the ongoing gang violence. This would just further impoverish the middle class, and it would decrease the threat that they would pose to the gangs as they would have no wealth by means that they could resist. By targeting middle-class businesses and owners through kidnappings and protection rackets, many businesses have either been destroyed or closed down as owners are trying to protect themselves and their families. Street vendors are robbed or otherwise intimidated for money, and looting is not just confined to Haitian businesses. Relief supplies that are crucial to feeding the people in the first place are being intercepted by gangs and then used in order to be able to fuel their operations. The population of Haiti is being controlled and intimidated by these gangs 
is. The food is being controlled, the water is being controlled, healthcare is being denied, and this is something that has become an even greater issue as with the complete breakdown of the government, the country is currently suffering from a widespread cholera outbreak. Something that was only made worse by yet another natural disaster, a 7.2 magnitude earthquake that would strike back in August of 2021, causing over 2,200 deaths and leaving 600,000 people in need of humanitarian assistance. Something that the gangs would take great advantage of. As a result of these mounting threats to life, it really is no surprise that the residents of Port-au-Prince are just fleeing from the capital in massive numbers. My friends, the unfortunate reality of the situation is that solving the overwhelming issue on the ground in Haiti is not something as simple as just a military crackdown. You've seen time and time again about what happens when the U.S. or some other international force comes in. It never really lasts with Haiti even if temporary stability is achieved. Gangs are often better armed than the police as they will wield assault rifles and machine guns that are obtained from corrupt police officers or smuggled from the American black market off the Florida coast. Furthermore, corruption is way more complex than just simple bribery, as many politicians and police officers are paid off by the gangs in order to maintain disorder and political violence within the country. The reality is that no real state authority exists over those who break the law. If arrests of gang members are made, then they are very quickly released released after a call to their benefactors. Because a number of politicians are involved, the deadly cycle of growing gang violence is something that would only continue. Unfortunately, no real state authority exists over those who break the law, as if any arrest of gang members are made, then they simply have to make a call to the person that is supporting them, i.e. a politician in some cases, and they are then eventually freed. Thus, the deadly cycle of growing gang violence within the country will continuously persist with no real way out, and it feeds into this continuous cycle of why resolution within the country of Haiti being able to solve its problems itself doesn't really seem to be possible. The acting president, and again, we're still saying acting from this because no actual elections have occurred, Henry has agreed to organize transparent representative elections this year, or at least he was supposed to. The goal of everything was that a new Haitian government was supposed to be formed in early 2024. Mind you, this acting president has essentially ruled by decree with no possibility of challenge since January of 2023 because the last elected officials, again, of the Haitian Senate had their terms expire. There are quite literally no elected representatives in this democratic government in Haiti. And no matter how many promises Henry ends up making to the population, this is not something that actually serves any kind of real comfort to either them or to the international community because similar pledges were made back in 2021, and that didn't happen. He still has not even set a date for when the supposed elections are supposed to occur, because now even if Henry does actually make good on his promises for reinstating democratic representation, it is completely ridiculous to suggest that this is something that would just heal Haiti. It's not going to fix things. With almost no support for any kind of sitting government, combined with the state's current gruesome security situation, this means that even trying to host elections at this point is unlikely to do any kind of positive thing for the country whatsoever. And so if the government won't do something, maybe the citizens of Haiti will. Because amidst all the chaos, amidst everything that we have been talking about so far, the citizens of Haiti themselves seem to be increasingly turning to vigilante operations in order to be able to fix things within their own country, either doing things by themselves or also working alongside police in order to carry out anti-gang operations. In fact, one of the crazy things about this entire situation is that among all the political violence that would take place in Haiti in 2023, fatalities from vigilante events made up around 15% of those. At the same time that that is happening, a new government was supposed to be created by February 7th in 2024, so only around two weeks ago, but still no election was held and no new government would enter office. This in turn would lead to mass violent protests that would erupt on February 7th, with protesters in the capital and other major regions calling for Henry to resign. Roads were blockaded and some protesters would attack government buildings, and at the same time there were clashes between demonstrators and the police that would leave several individuals dead. Henry would condemn the violence and yet again would pledge to hold election once the president's security issues were resolved, adding that he was willing to work with anyone who would help them emerge from this crisis. But at this point, that's really kind of hard to believe because no one knows what's going to happen.
Unfortunately for Haiti, the thing that may be necessary in the situation is international intervention. However, in the context of the nation's most current issues, it's not something that can just be straightforward given. Ariel Henry has been calling for foreign assistance since October of 2022 to try and reinforce the Haitian police in their bid to regain civil authority. But these requests haven't exactly been well received, and for very good reason. To do so would A, legitimize Henry's claim to authority, even when there is no legal or constitutional basis in the first place, and B, no one wants to get involved in yet another foreign conflict. And so in response to the West hesitating to act, Kenya now appears to at least be trying to lead the charge towards securing stability for Haiti, with President William Ruto urging the United Nations Security Council to back a mission in support of a country that, quote, deserves better from the world. However, when we talk about this, no amount of foreign aid will ever actually fix Haiti's situation until the underlying issues that created all of this in the first place are fixed. Because Haiti, my friends, is unfortunately a broken and failed state. One that did not break recently, it did not break suddenly, it did not break for the first time. No, Haiti is a state that unfortunately, since its very founding, has always been kind of broken. So my friends, thank you very much for watching. This has been Sakui with the History of Everything podcast YouTube channel. Thank you all very much. I ask that you like, comment, and subscribe, especially considering that the with the length of this video, with the amount of work that has been put into it, and with the whole issue that YouTube might take issue with this video in the first place, you never really know considering the subject matter. Your support means the absolute world to me. Thank you, my friends, and I will see you all next time. Let me know in the comment section below what it is that we should do next. Goodbye, my friends.